Okay, hello. Hope everyone's having a fantastic day wherever you're in the world. And hello to all my subscribers, not subscribers, trolls, bots, lurkers alike. I hope you're having a fantastic day wherever you are in the world or you're watching in the future. I hope it's much better than what we're at now. I'm recording this. Um, I'm having a lot of troubles trying to record this. This is in re response to someone that was on Alan's show today that um, decided to have a debate and continued. And I'm just going to show some text, okay? The Bible says angels were never called the sons of God. For unto which of the angels he said at the time, Thou art my son, to this day I have begotten thee. Hebrews 1.5 KGV Hebrews 1.5 is a challenge to find one passage in the Old Testament where God called his angel as his son. Of course, the answer according to Hebrews 1.5 is that God never called an angel or angels his son. Therefore, anyone calls an angel son of God, they are contra contradicting God. This should be the end of the issue. However, this is not this answer is not enough for those who are deep in the false belief that the angels are sons of God. Therefore, for their sake, let's continue further with the study. The Hebrew textual confusion. The confusion about the sons of God is a large part because of the Masoretic Hebrew text. The Masoretic Hebrew text is a 9th century AD post testament Hebrew Old Testament text that is used for most English translations today. The Masoretic text is not without issue. Scholars have identified certain errors within the text, and there are Old Testament quotes by New Testament writers which do not match the Masoretic Hebrew text, which was developed by Rabbi Nicole and Scable authorities in opposition to Christianity. Regarding the topic of sons of God, the Masoretic text adds confusion to the topic rather than clarifies. In the Masoretic text, the Hebrew text, the son, term son of God is used in Genesis 6, 2, 6, 4, Job 1, 6, 2, 1, and 38, 7. Most people that read those passages conclude that the sons of God are angels, must be angels. However, the confusing part of the Masoretic text also labels men and even the nation of Israel as sons of God as seen in the following passages. Yet the number of children of Israel shall be the same as sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered, and it shall come to pass that they, in place where it is said unto them, Ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. Hosea 1, 10 KGV. When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of his Egypt. Hosea 1, Hosea 11, 1 KGV. And they'll say to the, unto the Pharaoh, Thus said the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Exodus 4, 22 KGV. And I say unto thee, let my son go, that he may serve me. Exodus 4.23 KGV Are the sons of God angels, or are they men? If one relies on the Masoretic Hebrew text alone, or translations based on the Masoretic, the confusion will never be resolved. Especially when Hebrews 1.5 clearly states that God never called an angel son, but yet you have a Masoretic Hebrew title, Hebrews using this title, sons of God, for angels and men. Solid doctrine cannot be built on that text is ambiguous, unclear, and the Masoretic text is very ambiguous on this subject. However, thanks to be God for preserving his word and for giving us numerous texts other than the Masoretic, we can cross-examine to get the truth. Let us resolve the confusion by using the Greek text of the Old Testament, the text the New Testament writers quoted from. The Greek text of the Old Testament solves the mystery of the sons of God. The Septuagint is the Greek translation of the much older Hebrew text, older than the Masoretic text. The Septuagint can be found among the Dead Sea Scrolls and copies in the entire Greek Old Testament can be dated as far back as 300 to 350 AD. Not only is the Septuagint older than the Hebrew Masoretic text, but the Septuagint often agrees with the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Septuagint, and I'm sorry for saying this word wrong, is almost a word-for-word -word match of the Old Testament quotations recorded in the New Testament. Therefore, if the apostles trusted the Septuagint, why shouldn't we? The Septuagint says, Job 1, 6 are angels, and it came to pass on the day that, behold, the angels of God come to stand before the Lord, and the devil came with them. There is perfectly good word in Hebrew for angel or angel, malak, so there was no need for the Masoretic text to be elusive or cryptic in its description of angels by calling them sons of God. Thankfully, the Septuagint gets right to the point and calls it like it is. According to the Septuagint, Job 1, 6 are about angels, not men. So let us move to Job 2, 1. The Septuagint says, Job 2, 1 are angels, and it came to pass on a certain day that the angels God came to stand before the Lord, and the devil came among them to stand before the Lord. No speculation is clear, and simple truths from the Greek text. So, we have Job 1, 6, Job 2, 1, clearly defined as angels thanks to the Septuagint. What about Job 3, 8, 7? 
When the stars were made, all my angels praised me with a loud voice. The Septuagint has a different read of the Masoretic text first. There is no mention of the morning stars in the Septuagint, which had people guessing and wondering if it meant Jesus or another class of angels when they read the Masoretic. Second, there is nothing in this verse to suggest that the angels are sons of God because the term was not used. Instead, the Septuagint clearly states that the angels, not sons of God, praised God during the creation of the stars. For anyone who doubts the accuracy of the Septuagint reading, they should look at Job 38.7 in the Tagum of Job, which is found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. In the Tagum of Job, verse 38.7 is closer to the Septuagint than the Masoretic text. Again, this proves the Septuagint is more aligned in more ancient Hebrew than text than the 9th and 18th century Masoretic, which many English translations use. So the Masoretic text is confusing about who the Son of God are. The Septuagint eliminates, eliminates that confusion. With the Septuagint, we can know 100% that Job 1, 6, 2, 1 and 38, 7 are all referencing angels, not men. Now let's take everything learned so far and use it to prove the sons of God in Genesis chapter 6 are not angels. The Masoretic text used the term sons of God for Job 1, 6, 2, 1, 38, 7 and also in Genesis 6, 2 and 6, 4. That the gun sons of God saw the daughters of men and that were fair and they took them wives. Whomever so they choose. The Nephilim were in the earth those days and also after that when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men and they bore children to them the same were mighty men that were old and men of renown no wonder people are confused when they only read the Masoretic text people tied Job 1 6 2 1 38 7 to Genesis 6 2 and 6 4 and speculate that Genesis 6 2 and 6 4 must mean that the angels married human women however that is a wrong conclusion and conclusion people should never come up with if they use the serpentine text the Septuagint is a critical tool for knowing the intent of the original writers. The Septuagint gives us clarity once again and proves the sons of God in Genesis are, not, are men, not angels. Unlike the Masoretic scribes that use the perfect word for angels, Malak, and refuse to use it, the Septuagint is much more accurate and stretches the point to toe. While the Masoretic texts use an obscure term, sons of God, in the book of Job and Genesis, the Septuagint calls it for what it is in the Septuagint. The angel is an angel, and man is a man. The Septuagint clarifies that angels are involved in Job 1, 6, 2, 1, and 38, 7. But in Genesis 6, 2 and 6, 4, angels are not mentioned. The term sons of God is not an alternative phrase for the angels in the Septuagint. Here, the Septuagint reads that the sons of God, having seen the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, took themselves wives from who all they chose, Genesis 6, 2. Now the giants were upon the earth in those days, and after that, when the sons of God were wont to go to the daughters of men, they bore children unto them. These were the giants of old and the men of renown. Genesis 6:4. In the Septuagint, Job 1, 6, 2, 1, and 38, 7, angels cannot be used to claim Genesis 6, 2, 6, 4, sons of God are fallen angels because Genesis and Job use different terms to the Septuagint. Therefore, the Septuagint eliminates Job 1, 6, 2, 1, 38, 7 as proof text to interpret it Genesis 6, 2, and 6, 4. The Septuagint has also proven a pattern of identifying when angels are involved in text and when the Son of God men are involved. Therefore, since angels are not mentioned in Genesis 6, 2, 6, 4 in the Septuagint, then the obvious conclusion is that the sons of God are men, not fallen angels. If the Septuagint would have used Greek word for angels instead of sons of God, then there would have been undeniable proof that Genesis 6 was about fallen angels. Need more proof that the sons of God are different than angels? Let's look up Deuteronomy 32, 43 in the Septuagint. It's to see more proof that the Septuagint defines the sons of God as men and not angels, rejoice your heavens with him and let all the angels worship him. Rejoice, you Gentiles, with all these people and let the sons of God strengthen themselves in him, for he will avenge the bloods of his sons, and he will render vengeance and recompense justice to his enemies, and the Lord, and will reward them that they hate him. And the Lord shall purge the land of his people. Deuteronomy 32:43. As seen in this verse, Deuteronomy 32:43, the angels of God are mentioned, Gentiles are mentioned, the sons of God are mentioned. So, if the sons of God are different from the angels, how can it be proven? If the sons of God were the same as angels, then we'd need to ask, when did angels shed blood? The verse said, let sons of God strengthen themselves in him, for he will avenge the blood of his sons. So, if the sons of God are angels, then somewhere angels had just shed blood. However, the Bible says angels are spirits, Hebrews 1, 7 and 1, 14. And spirits do not have flesh and blood, Luke 24, 39. So they cannot have blood either. 
This evidence is not available in the Mesoic text because Deuteronomy 3243 in the Mesoic text reads differently. But we can trust the Septuagint because it is what the New Testament writers used when they quoted Deuteronomy 3243. Look up Hebrews 1 6, which quotes Deuteronomy 3243, the passage we just read. Compare it to the Mesoic text and then compare it to the Septuagint. The Septuagint text is what Hebrews 1 6 is quoting, not M Mesoic text. The sons of God are not angels in Deuteronomy 32, 43, and the Septuagint shows they are not angels in Genesis chapter 6 either. The Septuagint shows a mystery about the identity of the sons of God. What about the Nephilim? Aren't they proof the sons of God of angels? The Septuagint says, Now the giants were upon the earth in those days and after, and that when the sons of God were wont to go to the daughters of men, they bore children to them. Those were giants of old and men were renowned. Genesis 6, 4. Nephilim are not the children of human, woman, and angels. The Bible says the giants were upon the earth in those days and after. So, the Nephilim were on the earth before, during, and after the sons of God had their children. Therefore, no one can claim that the sons of God have ever to be supernatural creatures because their children are Nephilim giants. The Bible debunks that claim. Genesis 4, 6 proves that the Nephilim are not exclusive to the sons of God and the daughters of men. Angels mating with women is a myth and that people likely got from the book of Enoch. The truth about Genesis 6 is that in the account of wicked humanity, not wicked angels, people should not assign a title to angels that contradicts words, God's words. Hebrew 1, 5. Sons of God are men, clear and simple, and the Septuagint proves that point, whereas the Mesoric text gives little or no clarity on the matter. Need more proof? If the Nephilim giants are only the children of the fallen angels, then how did Crush, the son of Ham, which is the son of Noah, have a giant for a son? And the sons of Ham, Crush, Mosarim, and Put, Canaan, sons of Crush, Seba, Hevve, Septeb, Remem, Septeba, and the sons of Remem, Sheba, Dedan, and Crush begot Nimrod. He became mighty one in the earth. He was mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. Genesis ten six nine. The word mighty is Hebrew word gibba, which is the same word used in Genesis 6-4. The same became mighty men which were of old. The Septuagint text reads, And the sons of Sham, Shush, Mezrin, Pod, Shanan, and the sons of Shus, Seba, Eluva, Stabatha, Rigma, Stabatha, and the sons of Rigma, Seba, and Dadan, and Shaz begot Nimrod, and he became a giant upon the earth. He was a giant hunter before the Lord God, and there the says, Nimrod is a giant hunter before the Lord, Genesis ten six nine. Sorry for saying these names wrong. Crush, Chus, gave birth to Nimrod, Nimrod, and Nimrod began to become a giant. Nimrod was not the son of a fallen angel, but he began to become a giant. This verse shows us that the angels are not needed to produce giants, so the fairy tale can end. Also, this passage of scripture shows the word giant may mean something different besides one's physical structure. We use similar terms today when a person is a giant of industry or a giant fan or something. We're not talking about their physical size, but rather the size of their achievement, skills, or depth of involvement. Therefore, an ancient giant may be larger than the average man of the past, but a giant could also mean a skilled hunter and a warrior. Conclusion The sons of God are not angels. 1. Hebrews 1 5 says that God never called an angel his son. Therefore, angels cannot be the sons of God in the Bible. 2. In the Old New Testaments, men and women are regarded as the sons and daughters of God, not angels. 3. The Septuagint shows that Job 1, 6, 2, 1 and 38, 7 are angels of God and never uses the term sons of God in those verses. However, Genesis 6, 2 and 6, 4, the Septuagint uses the term sons of God, which means Job 1, 6, 2, 1 and 38, 7 cannot be used to define what a son of God is which people attempt to do in the Mesoic text. Therefore, the sons of God in Genesis 6 are men. The Septuagint shows in Deuteronomy 32.43 that the angels, the sons of God, are not the same. The Septuagint even takes the step further by showing that the angels can't be sons of God because it says the sons of God shed blood. Angels don't bleed or even have blood. Therefore, the sons of God are men. 5. Genesis 6.4 shows that Nephilim were on the earth before, during, and after the sons of God and the daughters of men were married. The Nephilim are not exclusive to the relationship between the sons of God and the daughters of men. 6. Genesis 10 shows that Nimrod became Nephilim, and he was a grandson of Ham, Noah's son, not the son of a fallen angel. When people put a sh push aside rhetoric and mess and do a careful examination of the Bible, they will be able to see the sons of God and not angels, the sons of God and men. Final caution. Do not mix the Septuagint reading with the Mesoic text and come to the conclusion that the Septuagint interprets the sons of God as angels in your Masoretic-based translation. 
Stick to the read of the serpentine alone. For clarity on the topic, do not mix the two to make the one. I'll, um, yeah, refer to it, final word. Claiming angels are the sons of God dilutes the meaning of that title, which is only associated with Christ and the believer's com incumbent relationship with God the Father. Sonship is not a minor topic. It is a serious issue because there is a lot behind the title, Son and Daughter of God. The title Son of God is not a title that scholars, minister, and people have the right or authority to grant who women or whatever they want, primarily when they do so based on opinion and speculation. Only God has the authority to designate who his sons and daughters will be. As we studied the word, we saw that God never said an angel in his son. Even more, we never see a fallen angel being called a son of God. Nevertheless, people have no problem bestowing that honor on Satan and his angels. The word of God is our final authority, not ancient myths, modern books, or some doctoral dissertation. This teaching was based on God's word alone, because the full contents of the scripture gives light and leads us to the truth. The word of God debunks the idea of the angels being sons of God, but people ignore God's word because they rather believe in myths. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned into fables. 2 Timothy 4, 4 KGV We pray that this teaching strengthen the importance in the titles of son and God and daughter, along with encouraging readers to study the blessings, inheritance and promise associated with these titles. Wicked angels should never be given the title of son of God. To God be glory. Okay, so um, I'll leave the links for this in the description. So uh, I'll add what this man had to say on Alan's channel. And I, I just like people to have a look. Like, yeah, it's good to ask questions, but do your research first. All right.